So we had an excellent talk by David Gujar in the next room. You guys got that, right? Yeah, pretty interesting as how poly polyformic puzzlers could be solved using Python. And he said his experience about um, using Python and how he got involved with uh, DocUtils project when he was trying to solve puzzles using Python. And just out of context, okay, um, uh, even my uh, interest were like this. So I had n puzzle solver, which is like you have a two dimensional matrix and you puzzle up, you solve a n puzzle. When that's something which had interest, like recollecting my uh, solution for the n puzzle. Uh, this is completely different top topic altogether. Uh, this is internet protocol libraries in Python. And um, I assume that all of you have used Python or have heard about Python. And um, uh, if you have, if you have just like, even if you had attended the sessions yesterday or one or two sessions now, you must have got a fairly good idea about what it is. Uh, it comes with a batteries included philosophy. So what I mean is like when you are trying to build big applications, all your batteries are included with the language. And uh, you end up building good applications using the libraries provided by the language. So, uh, so before I dwell into the topic, Uh, something about me, uh, I'm a Python core developer. I'm the maintainer of many internet related modules. Uh, I'm a software engineer working for Akamai uh, in Bangalore. Um, so this topic is something which uh, uh, I didn't have to prepare much because something which I had been working on for a while now, fixing, fixing bugs. So what I'm going to share is more out of my practical experience than uh, a presentation as such. I will get to that when we look at the URL pass and the other modules, and I will see a snip, snippet of code and we'll dwell deeper and deeper into it, recursively going into what it goes behind the module to the layer of sockets, and then we get the response back from the clients, okay? Um, so uh, let's get started. So what's the status of Python now? Uh, how many of you use Python 3 at the moment? Yeah, pretty good. Actually, so currently all development happens in Python 3.2.a2, which is a2 release, uh, which will get released pretty soon. Uh, Georg Brandel is the release manager for that. And uh, this is the trunk where all the code development happens in Python 3.2. So any bug fixes will directly go in there and it will be backported to Python 2.7, okay? Uh, if you are using Python, which came as a standard distribution in your operating system, you must probably be using Python 2.6 because I'm not sure if Ubuntu has started shipping Python 2.7. I don't think it has. So, uh, but it's Python 2.7 is in maintenance mode, which is, means that it's been released and available for the public. And the good thing about Python 2.7 is like it has, it's a very good bridge between Python 2, Python 3.2 and Python 2.x. Many of the features which can be backported and which make sense to be backported have been backported to Python 2.7. Python 3.1.2 is again a release maintenance branch where uh, it's just an incremental release. And uh, only uh, if you see what's the difference between Python 3.2 and Python 3.1, it's the improved GIL, which is optimized further in Python 2.2, except for that everything else is same in Python 3.1 and Python 3.2. Python 3.0 is that, don't use it. Uh, it's, the reason is like the IO library was written in Python itself instead of C and uh, everyone discovered that it had a huge performance lag. So uh, it immediately went further that, uh, no, don't use it. Let's go on to Python 3.1 and it was released, okay. We termed it as experimental release, but uh, yeah, no one will support it. Python 2.6.5, which is surprisingly many of us use it, is no longer supported. By what I mean is that only security fixes by, will go in. So if you develop an application and which is in Python 2.6, and you discover that there's a bug in that application and it leads to the language or the library, uh, and if you file the bug in bugs.python.org, uh, it may not get fixed. It, you will just be asked to upgrade it to Python 2.7, which is very easy to do, of course, because all the languages, it's backward compatible, but uh, it won't get fixed in Python 2.6 because only security fixes will go, and uh, Barry Warsaw, who's the, who's the lead developer of Mailman project, is the is the release manager for Python 2.6.5. Uh, so what are the internet protocols in support? Um, if you start using 
a language and the library for developing big applications, uh, almost always you will think that whenever it comes to networking and internet, you so the bare bones of the networking and internet is the socket. So in uh, in our computer science classes and networking classes, we all have to do something or the other with the socket programming. And Unix network programming by Richard Stevens is something which we all have browsed through or heard about at least. And we know that that's the Bible for the socket programming. Um, it has been C programmers use that socket programming in a different way. But coming to Python, we are all, we, we have been defined to deal with much higher level, okay? So we don't have to do socket programming as C programmers have to do. And moreover, to develop big applications, you don't have to enter, think about the socket programming as such, even though they do deal with the internet and networking between the computers. Uh, you have very high level libraries available for you. Uh, so all the internet protocols and support libraries are nothing but the modules built on top of the socket module, which is like a very vague way of saying it, but no one looks at it like that. Everyone thinks that these are the libraries which are available for you to build the next browser, if you would like to build a browser, uh, to next Twitter client, if you would like to build a Twitter client, to next chat client, if you would like to build a chat client. Okay, it's client based. It's not something we are dealing with the web application. Okay, it's not. Web applications may use these libraries in some part, but it's mostly like uh, if you are, and if your web application is a client, then you will use these libraries. It's for a higher level programming. Uh, and uh, when you implement libraries, how will you, you, how will you design a library so that uh, many people may use it? So if I write a program in my college project, I can think that it's for my own use. At least my friend can use it too, because I, I must have said to him that this works that way. But when you are designing and writing a library, you should be pretty particular that your library is standards based. Okay. So if someone down in the road from Brazil or someone in the if someone in Australia tries to use your library, he shouldn't be confused that what this particular function is doing. Rather, he should be very certain that this function is to be acting according to the specification given the RFC. So if a mail is to be sent, the header should be in front and then this, this many headers are a must and these are optional and then comes the body part and what should be the format of the body part and what are the separators are all defined in the RFC. The same goes with the HTTP module, same goes with the URL handling module, how the URLs should be parsed, what kind of URLs make a valid URL and what, are, what kind of characters are not allowed in the URL, all of them are specified very well in the RFC. And any application it's worth its salt. If you say that it's a library which is like can be used in good applications, you better have to stick to the specifications of the RFC. That's when the other application developers will start using it. They'll trust you more, okay, because it's defined. Now, uh, there's another challenge when developing libraries. So you will think that, uh, you will think that uh, the RFC defines that the URL should be passed in a certain way. But you will think, but you will see that the common browser vendors like Microsoft, Firefox, Google Chrome have defined some other way of passing the URLs. So RFC defines that there are some characters which are invalid for the URL, but uh, but browser browser vendors have accepted it. They have gracefully accepted it. So there comes a de facto standard that uh, not just it's compliant with the RFC, but practicality. So you have this aphorism in the Zen of Python where practicality beats purity. You adopt to that too. So Python modules adopt to that philosophy pretty pretty seriously that. Uh, they, we see through that that what are the major browser vendors doing and what's the expected solution. Even then, the RFC doesn't say that. So we go on with uh, with saying that uh, this is a practical way to handling that stuff. So we'll be lenient with agreeing. We'll be lenient with accepting this kind of characters in the RFC. Sorry, in the in the library. So and most of these uh, most of these modules provide a commonly used helper function. So it's not just important to define the specifications in the RFC in a library. It's also useful to develop helper functions. And what I mean by the helper function is high level functions which can like use in your programs for the common purposes you want. For example, take the case of a URL library. Even though it is for parsing and using URLs in your applications, you must most often want to write a program which just fetches a page. So it's so easy to get a page function, get page or URL retrieve as a helper function, which will in turn use the URL library itself to do further. Oh, uh, so let's look at some of the common applications which are using the standard libraries, okay. Uh, Mercurial is the distributed revision control system written in Python. It uses a lot of these libraries like URL, lib, URL, parse, URL, lib2, 
and many of the libraries which we are going to do because it communicates over the network and uh, and it's written in python so instead of like developing their own uh, modules to deal with it they start they, it's best to use the library this is some of the some of the examples which i had in mind when i was like typing the um, typing the slides yesterday uh, but um, there are many more so uh, if once you have the idea of the libraries and when you go to the open source program and then look at the program you will see that the libraries are like important the google cl which is a recent open source project where you can do a lot of uh, blog update or uh, any of the things from the command itself command line it was recently released i just go went through the uh, went through the source code of that and i saw that it pretty extensively uses these internet protocol libraries because all it has to do it's like is a client and it has to interact with the google servers right so you can do many things with that so that these and then youtube download so if you are in ubuntu and you want to download the youtube you URL. If you pass on to it as a your argument, this downloads the file. All it does is parsing the proper URL, and then w instead of using a wget, it uses a URL retrieve to get the proper proper file name. So pretty simple applications with a lot of options. So you find this BitTorrent is a pretty good protocol which every one of you must have used in downloading for torrents, and it uses the URL and the socket libraries pretty well, al along with the algorithms which uh, the guy had developed. Uh, mailman uses a lot of uh, RFC 822 and uh, uh, other mail, mime, mime types and all the things which deals with the mail and uh, uh, mail and mime type URL. Uh, so uh, quickly, let's go into what's difference in uh, Python 2 and Python 3. As I started the talk, uh, there is a web browser module. These are like some of the lesser commonly used. Suppose if you are writing an application, for example, let's take the case of the Google CL, the command line tool of the Google. Uh, as soon as you post, as soon as you submit something, it gives you an authorization page, okay? And in order to give you that authorization page, you better, instead of like firing the browser, uh, firing the browser which is like a sensible browser in case of uh, Ubuntu or say Internet Explorer in case of the uh, Internet uh, in your Windows, you better use the web browser module because it knows that what is the correct browser in your operating system. And it works in a non-blocking way, wherein it just fires the browser and then returns you back to the program. Um, I mean, we may, we may never have a chance to use it, but uh, it saves you from countless hours of like uh, figuring out that what might be the good browser in the client's operating system. And because it knows that how to handle the browsers in if it's an environment variable or given that. Uh, CGI is the common gateway interface module, which is, okay, this slide is for the part that uh, these haven't changed in Python 2 and Python 3. So CGI module is the same, except for the internals, which of course changes. But the interfaces in Python 2 and Python 3 haven't changed. And then there's Web Services Gateway Interface Reference Module, which is like a reference implementation of the WSGI. Uh, even that hasn't changed. But in Python 3, it's still not a very steady solution because it's still worked out in terms of what is good in Python 3. Uh, in Python 3, there's a major, uh, major change wherein uh, it's internally everything is a unicode string and uh, when wsgi was uh, was int was like specification was defined it was ascii strings and they are like still working out that when we can have we are when we can have the interface between ascii string and a byte string but the reference implementation the interface of the refer reference implementation hasn't changed and uuid is a unique identifier generator which uh, is hasn't changed in python 2 and 3 which gives you a unique identifier uh, less commonly used modules like uh, FTPlib, Poplib, MyMaplib, and SMTPlib and TelnapLib have been changed either. Uh, FTP for handling FTP. And if you are using URLib module, you will find that you are using FTPlib with N2. Uh, Poplib for handling the POP3 mail clients, which rarely anyone uses these days, but yeah, people still use it because some good email providers provide POP3 accounts. Um, map, IMAP, SMTP, and TelnapLib. Rarely people do use it, but still it's available when you want to build it. Oh, so something surprising if I would like to share. There is something called NNTP lib, which is like News Network Transfer Protocol lib. Um, that had ported, had been ported to Python 3 and uh, hadn't been like uh, very, so how do we know that the certain libraries are not very much used? You will see less bugs in them, obviously, because, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting way of saying it. But yeah, the same case happened with the NNTP lib too. And uh, there was a huge discussion that why should we have NNTP lib in the standard library module itself. Yeah, it was like a plus one, plus zero kind of thing. But in, in same, 
okay, when news network transport protocol was used, NNTP clients were used, like news, now, nowadays we don't find that. We have Google Groups and Stack Overflow for doing the discussions, but previously it was comp.lang.python and all. People used to use the news readers. Um, and that time NNTP would have been used, but right now no. Uh, there is like, those news readers were supporting ASCII, and there were like proper communication in ASCII, even though the Unicode can be handled in some certain way. But with respect to the interfaces of handling ASCII and the bytes, there was a serious backward compatibility issue, but still Python 3 is going to have an NTP lib with a good support for bytes string. So you will see that even though it's not used, you can have the reference implementation of the protocols just because when you want to do a project using that, it's available. Uh, in, in Python 3, the URL lib has been changed into a package where the URL lib is one of the very old URL handling libraries where you can use to download files. That is, uh, when you use a 223 tool, it can change into a request response and a pass. What it means is whenever you are dealing with the, the, dealing with the network system, you define a request and a response. So a system or a server receives a request and sends back a response. Or a client sends a request and receives the response. So that's how you have to look at it. And uh, that's how it has been demarked in Python 3 as request response. And parsing is for parsing. For example, if you want a scheme of a particular page, you want to go to the page and then parse the scheme. So you have parsing facilities available. Uh, there are two libraries in, uh, in that. Two was an advanced feature, advanced library, which many of us use now. Uh, that's been, um, that's also, so that's been merged together. People had a confusion that why do you have URLib and URLib2? And in Python 3, there, there's no more confusion because you have a package by name URLib and you can use a request to request the resources and you give a response to give the response back. And parse is also no longer a separate module in itself. It's a package of by URL itself and has the module by name parse for parsing the. And uh, HTTP lib has been, uh, so there's a HTTP package that, which consolidates many of the common HTTP related requests previously well, spawned across many different uh, libraries. And uh, there's a couple of other things to highlight here. If you see on the left hand side, which are the modules in Python 2, you will see that um, they are like, um, it's called camel case or what? So that's like the Java style. Uh, not really camel case, but the first one with the caps and then the uh, capitalized modules. Okay, this is like, yeah, you can say that's capitalized, from fun, funny capitalized modules. There's no consistency over there. You see CGI HTTP as well, it's pretty funny. Okay, so um, it didn't follow the pep standard properly. Okay, so when you have uh, modules inside your Python library itself, which are not following the pep standards, which means that your modules should be written in a small case letters. Uh, in Python 3, it did happen that all modules follow the uh, pep standard. So you will see that the HTTP lib was converted into a package with a client because it was mostly used for client operations. The cookie lib was converted into a cookie jar and cookie lib is actually uh, yeah, implementation of the mechanized module. I saw a lot of news yesterday that someone had covered the mechanized module. Cookies are converted to a cookies, and uh, cookies are not normally used, but it's a very simple interface because you just implement a dictionary cookie class and then set the cookie and retrieve back the cookie. Uh, base HTTP server is the server module, which can help you to use build servers, but uh, it's not really, uh, you, can you can use it for creating dummy servers and uh, just for fun servers, like your testing servers. Not really, when you really want to create servers, you have to implement a much better mechanisms because these days the servers come in variety of flavors. Like you have Twister and you have front feeds release of that tornado. So they are pretty good in the technologies which they use to create servers. And uh, these are like, um, you can see it as the reference implementations and what they do behind. And the socket server is actually a synchronous server, which is pretty funny if you say that uh, your server is actually synchronous. But uh, the beautiful part of this is, it's this your synchronous server, when, when what I mean by synchronous server is like, um, yeah, it will give one response and then only the next response. You cannot do a multi, multiple requesting it. But this provides some mix-in classes. So one good thing in having these kinds of implementations of libraries, like you have the implementation of a server, you have the implementation of a mix-in classes, and then you combine them all to provide an asynchronous server which is good to learn actually. And it may be useful in your project when you just want a simple server. I mean, there have been use cases. XML RPC lib, it's most common when nowadays when you have to do a remote procedure call on the uh, remote machines where uh, there was, there's an XML RPC package in Python standard library which uh, uh, 
which is like a, which is which has a client and a server specification. It's a doc XML RPC server too. I never used that. But the XML RPC server and the lib concepts are pretty useful when you are going to do a remote call. Uh, web browser, you see this uh, pretty interesting that uh, um, uh, you you just have a open uh, tab and open new and it works. So you know that some of sometimes Python standard library modules can be invoked like uh, uh, using the minus m argument and uh, when you can pass yeah when you can pass of course the car, the the Wi-Fi is not there. But did you see that it did open? So, pardon? I, I haven't configured it, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wi-Fi is there, but I haven't configured it. I just switched on my computer. Uh, so, the part of this was uh, web browser module is available in the command line. I hope that many of you knew the trick that uh, you can use the module names. So, you can do it this way too. Import web browser. Web browser dot open new will open a new window so and look at it the other way I can do any kind of URLs okay so file URL so uh, th and you can use the other way too like you're opening the browser with the the command line module itself so uh, simple I mean you may use it whenever you want it uh, and the CGI module is also available when you want to write a proper CGI programs. And uh, Perl with CGI was pretty famous, by the way. Okay, whenever people used to learn Perl and they wanted to do, and even now I see a lot of CGI systems implemented in Perl. Uh, Python has a good CGI support too, but uh, Python has advanced much further than that. When we use the web services gateway interface specifications for for dealing with the web stuff. Okay. Uh, it's easy to do it in Python, like uh, you print a content type and uh, you give a, a print line which specifies the backslash or backslash n, which is the requirement by the CGI standard. And then you print whatever it is in the, uh, in the uh, HTML code because you specify the content type as HTML. And then you run your server in this. So for example, uh, I have this simple, I have the CGI. So let us say hello hello.py, uh, doing nothing, but uh, it defines the content type as HTML and prints the HTML hello world and it imports the CGI traceback module and when I do a print of 1 by 0 which is supposed to return a 0 division error because 1 by 0 is an exception, um, it will be cat caught by the exception handler and then its CGI exception handler will be called. So when we open that in uh, the browser with its local host CGI. So you find that the hello world is printed and the CGI exception handler gave a pretty nice, uh, what you can say, trace back with the colorization as where that exception occurred. So pretty, inter pretty easy to do a CGI programming. When, and CGI programming most often what you do is like you create a form and then you take a values in the form and then um, you, and form is stored as a dictionary in Python. It's like uh, accessing the names and the values in the dictionary. Um, that's with the CGI module. Uh, web services gateway interface reference is, uh, is defined. So when you, when someone says that this uses the WSGI, which is the web services gateway interface, they are referring to the PEP3U33, uh, which is uh, the specification of how, so what is this web services gateway interface is? Uh, Java programmers have had the servlets and uh, when people know the Java, Java servlets, they know that they can define these servlet objects and they put in different operating, different web servers which can talk to the servlet. They are kind of like a middle layer programming, middleware, which can talk to the web applications and can talk to the servers also. So that when you develop applications which can sit on Tomcat, which can sit on some other, I don't know, whichever, but here, what you can do is, we are using web services gateway interface reference implementation. You can design applications which can, uh, which can sit on, oh, okay, it's like this. No, so only the web framework authors care about the web services gateway interface application. Suppose if you are using an application using the framework, and that framework supports this specification, you know that uh, 
you can use your code in different web frameworks or to an extent slightly uh, in a similar way wherever that framework supports. You will have a common look and feel or look and feel or the logic of implementing your solutions. So you have Django, Turbo Gears, App Engine and different uh, web frameworks all supporting the web services gateway interface specifications. Standardization helps because you speak one language and follow similar protocols. Uh, with WSGI ref is a reference implementation for the web services gateway interface specification. And right now the next version is being written on which is called PEP 444 uh, which is for the reference implementation for PEP uh, for Python 3 actually. Um, because many of the frameworks haven't moved to Python 3 yet. Um, so what your yeah, web services gateway interface uh, uh, reference implementation actually is is like uh, look at the, la the last two lines of code is like making a server and serving it. Okay, but the part is this. The make server call takes a callable, which is a hello world application, and the callable takes an environment variable and another object, which is a callable again called start response. It defines the headers and the start response call, and then returns a list of the response. So when, so these kinds of specifications are provided in the uh, in the WSG spec, and uh, you find that if you use Google App Engine. They also define a similar kind of handlers and then the way how to format the response and then return the response object. So that's it's that's the implementation defined. It's at the bare bones level. Uh, unique identifier, I have never had a chance to use it. Yesterday only I had looked at the module. Uh, it's according to the specification again, RFC 4122. I'd like to know if anyone had a chance to use UUID or GUID in any of the... Pardon? Okay. Temp file module is there. Do you, do you mean in this way? Okay. Oh. So for the purposes which you say that uh, creating temple, there's already a module by name temp file. And I'm not sure if they are using the same. I don't think so. Because it's, yeah. Got, okay. I see. Uh, Anand? Okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's common use. That's a pretty good solution. Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah, so uh, the one implementation which is like, uh, again, there are standards defined for different kinds of UUIDs. The one implementation takes your MAC address, and the four implementation is just a random UUID. So uh, different kinds of UUIDs possible, and this format is actually standard again too. Okay, uh, URLib is actually the higher level function for fetching data. Uh, it's clients and client handling URL libraries. And the important function is urllib.url open, which just opens the URL and gives the response back, and you read the response like it. So what happens when you read a file, correct? You read a file, you create a file handle, and then you have a pointer to the file, and then you, uh, you have, and then you read the file. You think about reading a web page as reading a file, except that it's over the socket. And URL open is nothing but a wrapper over the socket call, which attaches to the remote object, which is a URL file and then helps you open it. So that's what the module does. Um, URL lib2 is the uh, next version of URL live. It creates a request object, and it has different handlers depending on the protocol, and gets a response by corresponding handler objects, where it separates the concerns of different things. Suppose if you find a new kind of a URL, and you want to, you want to handle that in your, live, in your application, so you can subclass or add a custom handler so there's a design pattern. Handler is actually not a design pattern, but there is a design pattern by name builder. Uh, builder design pattern is actually like, um, uh, it's like a, there's an opener director call which directs the different handlers and a builder is built for different handlers and then it directs which handler should invoke that. So these two patterns combine together in the URL lib, providing all the different functionalities and facilities it provides. It's pretty customizable and uh, useful. For example, when you want to extend it to support SSL, you can use the HTTPS handler, FTPS handler, add a custom handler to your object and then use it. So um, we'll just dwell a deep into the deep into the code when we go there. Um, I'm not sure like how effective will it be, but uh, I'll still go in and see, give you some in the details. Uh, parse for uh, parsing the URLs. Uh, most recently. Uh, IPv6 uh, URL parsing has been ha added into the Python standard library 
from Python 2.6 and Python 2.7 onward. Uh, bigger applications like when you use, yeah, like for example, when if you are using a URL shortening service, we are writing your own URL shortening service, you may probably use the URL pass module because you want to pass the URL and then create a better URL shortening service, right? HTTP labels like underlying low. So when you use the URLs, what that happens is it's nothing but the HTTP protocol. So URL lib sits on top of the HTTP lib, which again sits on top of the socket lib. And it also interfaces with the cookies and the other things. So this is nothing but the underlying layer of the URL lib and it implements the HTTP 1.1 specification. It implements the HTTP states on top of the socket. FTP lib is for handling FTP class. There's a single FTP class, okay, which takes the FTP URL and then, uh, <coughs> and then returns the, and follows the similar function. So it creates a class and whatever names which is defined in the commands, it is used by that and then uh, gets it. Uh, more recently, there was a guy by name Guillaume Polo Redalo. Uh, he got interested in adding SSL, no actually, SSL module was added in Python 2.6 for handling all the SSL related tasks, which is pretty useful because otherwise we were using PyOpenSSL, okay? And PyOpenSSL has, it's, it's a good module all, also, but um, SSL being such a common functionality nowadays, it's best to have it in the library. And uh, all these libraries are now getting upgraded to use TLS calls and SSL calls to have a secure communication. Um, socket server is like a synchronous network server and helper classes with mixin. Um, like, um, and uh, another, you can, so another trick, simple Easter egg if you say, that has simple HTTP server has a main module there where uh, you see that uh, if, you, if you run the module in uh, this way, for example, Let's do that. Okay, Python minus m. What's that? Simple HTTP server. HTTP server forty two forty two. Uh, let's create a directory who already exists. Pardon? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, sorry. I, I, this is maximum, by the way, sorry. Uh, let me create a first year file. Did I save it? Uh, port 42, 42. My favorite port. Okay, so you see that uh, your server is serving in 4242, and uh, if you see localhost colon 4242, yeah, uh, uh, it did open because we didn't have anything there. Uh, <coughs> it's not there, but um, let's add something. Title, header, body, okay. Hello, Python. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so you see that it's a web server running with a module. A pretty simple implementation of the web server. And uh, if you want to do a project like building a web server, you can look at this to see that. And the same simple HTTP server, the base HTTP server is the base class and CGI handling will be supported by the CGI server and this thing. And I'm not sure if the Django people, when they use the, com, the simple web server, if they are using the same. I haven't looked into the code. If it is, then let me know. <coughs> XML RPC lib is like for handling the remote XML call. So let's look at this. Um, so this one is importing XML RPC lib. It's importing a server which is running in the local host at 8000. And, uh, Look at this, it creates a proxy object and it creates a proxy object is even call. And this is even, this should be defined by the server, okay? Uh, that's what it is invoking at the server end and um, it will specify that if it's even or not. And how the server defines it, it's, it's pretty easy there. So it's a simple XML PC server where uh, the is even call is defined here and, um, and it runs the server at the local host at some port and it registers a function. So the important part is this, create a class by name simple XML RPC, you register a function whatever method you are, which takes the argument, 
Okay, and it's defined by the when you are using the method at the client end, and you serve it forever. So you will see that the server returns that if the thing is um, even or odd. So um, just if you want, we can go in a bit into that. This code icon India 2010. Inside the code, I have a okay. Web services API. This is different. Okay, forget it. So this, if you want, we can. So three is uh, even was false. Okay, I'm sorry. It's yeah. So three is even. It's so false, and then it's hundred is even. It shows true because the server is running here. Okay, one which is running down, which is an XML RPC server which I just pasted it. Okay. Uh, how much time more have? I have like five minutes. Uh, there are good resources for this, like uh, uh, the. Py3k documentation, of course. There is uh, men's uh, Python module of the week. Uh, dive into Python 3. Um, there is PEP 3108, which is for uh, the standard library reorganization. And uh, good stack overflow questions, like most useful Python modules from the standard library, which uh, recently someone did a statistics from the PyPy, which is like a Python package index. How many modules from the standard library were used by the other packages? OS module was the most commonly used one. Then there was logging, and then there was URL lib2. And I was happy that some of the modules like uh, are pretty commonly used. Um, and the XML RPC server, not XML RPC servers, but the, but the servers like, for example, uh, the CGI HTTP servers and NNTP lib was like very rarely used, like eight times out of, uh, of the, all the packages which are present in PyPy Py, Py index. So that, that is there. Uh, that's a good resource. And before I like uh, break, um, I shall just uh, let's look at some of some common this thing. So, what is this? Is I don't have, I don't haven't configured the internet here Wi-Fi, but it's pretty common call to you create a, a URL lib request and then using a URL lib opener. So what it will do is like return the response back for this request. Okay. Um, I recently found this uh, debugger use utility called uh, PUDB, okay, Python Ur Win Debugger. Um, I mean, it looks in a very console way, uses curses and all those things. I didn't find, but more more recently, when debugging for bugs and then fixing bugs, I found that that's very useful. Okay, um, it will help you go back to your college days where you're using the Turbo C and other things. For example, this is how you look. Uh, yeah, look-wise, it's not very modern, but if you, and it has all the features of a most common debugger, and especially if you are used to Vim and Emacs instead of doing it, this is pretty useful. For example, you can go to the variables window, and then you expand the variables window, and then see what are the contents of the URL, uh, URL library, what different handlers which have been already added to the library, and uh, um, go back, and then you can switch, um, go to the stack, Go, go to the stack and then see what is happening. Okay, now I stepped into this. So as I said, the how the URL library module happen, happens is it creates an opener director class. Like, as I said, the design pattern for the builder. It, there's an opener director class which creates an opener director object and it adds a lot of different handlers to it. And uh, there will be a HTTP handler, there will be HTTPS handler, FTP handler and all those things. And depending on the URL, you will parse the URL and find out what kind of a handler is required. For example, if it is a FTP URL, you will call the FTP handler. If it is a file URL, you will call the file handler. And uh, when that handler opens the do open method, like which is what is opening the call. And when it's a HTTP handler, which is calling the do open method, you know that it's a HTTP. So you will call the HTTP protocol, HTTP lib protocol, and in there you will find the wrapper over the socket modules for 
creating a socket and passing the appropriate headers and then uh, giving uh, uh, receiving the response header back and then returning the thing. So it all builds into a pretty good uh, style of having the big picture framework. So we can quickly go into it. So for example, you see that I'll quickly go in. Okay, just it may like bit of a ramble, but uh, bear with me. Um, sorry. What did I do? I was in cap spot, sorry, that's what I was like, thinking what's happening. <laughs> so it creates the, it, uh, so if the URL is of this type, like uh, this, it unwraps the URL, that's a simple function to unwrap the URL, and then creates the type, post, port, a tunneling, oh yeah, sure, I'll finish. Okay, tunnel for, it was recently added in Python 3 for, for example, if you wanted to do a SSL, which uses the socket call, so that the tunnel host, and then ask the headers and under unredirected headers if you don't want to do it. And then once the request URL is available, you can store the request URL, which you can see on the top that what is the request URL. And there you call the parse function again to see which is the host. Because when you want to contact a URL, you should contact the host in the socket, right? So you will find that uh, the parse function is called and it will split. URL parse is nothing but the wrapper over URL split for returning the host. And um, at the end, if you see, after splitting, um, it creates an allocation. I'll go back further. And um, the return will be a host. So if you see that on the top, there's a host which is already available now. And uh, port, if it is available, it gives. So you find that the origin request host is in.pycon.org. And uh, if it is this thing, and URL open, if you see, it is building an opener. If you see the build opener, as I said, the builder builder design pattern, and it build opener creates a different types of handlers. For example, here's an opener reader, opener director call, which creates an opener class, which which stores all the handlers which is required. And then here are the default classes like proxy handler, unknown handler, HTTP handler, default he file HTTP and error. And for all these handler, you instantiate it, you create a class, and uh, I'll go past it. I will not go into details of because when each of the handlers are called, it stores the states of the handlers. And um, when all the default classes are added, you create an object for handling the different handlers. On top, if you see, you will see that all the functions are added, and then the opener is created. So you have an object which is capable of handling all the different kinds of protocols, and this object is available to you. And when this object, you call the open function, the appropriate, uh, so appropriate get type, it will show what kind of a type is there. So this will return a HTTP. There you see it's a HTTP. And now, the, now if you see the protocol is a HTTP, and now protocol HTTP request call, because we were doing HTTP of in.pycon.org. In so that call is called, and, um, and if you see that, uh, it will go on further to, if you see the stack, URL open, call the open, it called the do request and uh, get host. And, uh, And yeah, and the HTTP open call the do open, which will call the HTTP libs socket, and then it will return the response. Because I am not over the Wi-Fi, uh, it may not. So, so that's pretty much I had to share. If you have any questions, please. No questions? Thanks a lot. goes up to like 10 million people. So the application shouldn't stop working. There shouldn't be uh, like server failure or other things. So this is one aspect of uh, scalability. So scalability basically it means that, uh, you know, your application should keep on growing as your users keep on um, growing. So this is this is like in brief what is scalability. Now there are two, uh, two things in scalability when it comes to 
so one is like scaling up and the other one is scaling out okay so you know while i was setting uh, i was thinking about uh, what could be the best example for demonstrating the difference between scaling up and scaling out and i thought of one thing it might not be uh, very precise in terms of definition but it will i hope help you clear your doubts about scaling up and scaling out so our heart beats at the rate of like uh, 72 beats per minute and when you start running or jogging so the heart beat increases to like 80 82 90 so this might be termed as scaling up architecture wherein you have a resource it you know you pump in more uh, and more and until it reaches its maximum limit so this is like a scaling up architecture wherein there is a hardware limit on whatever we do and then there is a scaling out so you know when you uh, you think about something you see something you watch a movie you do something so the information is stored in neural networks inside your brain so that architecture could be called as a scale out architecture as in um, the more you think about something the more you see about something the more number of neurons are involved in storing that data and processing it when you want to uh, just use it later so all right so that could be termed as scale out architecture but the basic difference in, in scaling up and scaling out lies in a shared memory so in a scale up architecture where you have uh, concurrent programming going on multi processor machines you have a shared memory space that is uh, that is between like uh, shared like between all the processors and resources but in a scale out application like the we have the google app uh, google app engine or the cloud computing so in those cases the shared memory space is what is lagging so things become really difficult about how to manage a server in these things okay so um talking next to google app engine so google app app engine is like it's a it's a framework provided by google so wherein you can develop deploy web applications on google infrastructure so as as it says that it's it's a it's very simple it's very easy to build a simple application you can deploy it very easily on the same infrastructure that is used by google that means you have access to their data store their uh, proprietary database management system which is the big table and apart from that other infrastructures like the network speed the bandwidth the memcache and all those things so talking about the application environment uh, what are the application environment that any google app engine application has so any um, any application it you know it it needs uh, to be to have some kind of a memcache so that it can perform fast any application needs to have some kind of a data store it needs to perform some kind of queries on the data store it needs to perform some transaction related stuff so all these things are provided by google app engine so you don't need to worry about okay this particular feature was uh, was available in my last framework and this not available in app engine of course there might be some restrictions because uh, you know we work on a scalable architecture we uh, use google's infrastructure where in possibly millions other applications are working so there has to be some limitation but the limitations are uh, you know you can very easily harass those limitations so that they are best for you and then uh, there is the sandbox environment wherein every application is uh, has their own environment wherein an application can execute so that environment is very secure generally so you know you are very sure that your application cannot access any other applications data even all of even though all of them are on the same uh, like infrastructure and any application can work only when there is a http or https request coming from a web browser or you know there is an http or http request apart from that an application can also communicate via email and then runtime environment the um, app, app engine was initially released with the python run runtime environment and after some time they also released the java runtime environment so uh, for the java guys uh, there has been a lot of uh, like what can you say confusion in ab about what is java runtime environment so the java runtime in, in java runtime environment it's not just the java it's about any language that gets uh, compiled to java runtime environment so in that terms you know it's uh, it's probably even possible that you can use any different language non java but which gets compiled into java to um, to get your programs executed on google app engine but we will be talking about python runtime environment here so and in the python runtime environment uh, pure python modules are provided all the standard uh, modules which are there in python they are um, inside the google app engine python runtime environment 
And uh, one thing that is important is that only pure Python modules are supported. As in, uh, if there is module which which is you know which has a C base or C plus plus base or something, so they are not supported. And uh, you can also add your modules as long as they don't uh, violate any other modules uh, or standards. As in, you know, uh, the the C or something. And then the other thing in Python runtime environment is that the file system is read only so you cannot write into the file system whenever you have to write anything you have to write it in the data store only you cannot write anything or create any temporary file or anything like that into the data uh, into the file system and then comes the data store so data store is the uh, most important part because it is uh, it is what is built on top of a big table and you know, big table was propriety and um, for a long period, uh, amount of time, the big table was used only internally by Google for all their services. So with App Engine, they have exposed their part of their big table, which is called the data store, to be used by other people as well, other developers for creating applications. Uh, we'll talk about data store in more detail as we proceed, because that is what ultimately helps you to scale. And then we have the Google Accounts API. So in any of your application, you don't need to create a separate module for managing user and you know containing their login, logout, and all those things, cookies and sessions. So the Google accounts make sure that it is all handled internally. So all you have to do is you have to uh, give, just give a login link. When the user clicks on that link, it automatically gets redirected to the Google login page. And after that, uh, it's redirected back to your application when the user logs in. And then there are services like Memcache APIs and uh, Memcache API, and then image processing library inbuilt. And then there are uh, some, all right. And then there are URL fetch modules as well. And there are a couple of other modules which are like provided as a services package. So you know they are basically they help uh, build your applications in a very fast manner and very smoothly. And apart from that, uh, cron jobs and task queues. Now these are something that have been added lately and task queues are, uh, yeah, they are still in experimental phase. So, so these are basically for the batch processing and backend jobs. Okay, so uh, we'll like proceed with a very simple Hello World application as in how to uh, go with Hello World. Now one thing uh, which is uh, very important to runtime is that any application in, um, any request can go along for a maximum of 30 seconds only. So if your process at the server side, it's taking more than 30 seconds, then the app engine will raise a deadline exceeded error and it will kill that application. So you have to make sure that all your requests, all your processing at the backend side, it has to be within 30 second time limit. Now there are times when, uh, when this 30 second time limit seems to be small, but there are workarounds for this also. We'll talk about those things uh, later. So this is the very simple Hello World application. So you know you just have to import from Google.AppEngine.ext import web app. Web app is a WSGI framework, and then from web app you import run WSGI app. You define a class main page which uh, handles a request. So okay, uh, coming to app.yaml, we'll go back to the main application later. So uh, app.yaml. So what happens is that whenever a request comes to Google App Engine, so first it goes into the app.yaml file. It sees that what the handlers, what are the, uh, what is the URL uh, regular expression. Then it finds a script. Like in this case, we have the URL regular expression that anything that goes after the slash, it is handled by the script hello world.py. So the request which is coming as, uh, let's say if the name of my application is hello world. So hello world.appspot.com slash. So it will be handled by the hello world.py script. And in the hello world.py, it will again go and see the handlers that for a slash, we have the main page class, which will be handling those things. It will go back to the main page and it will um, just put out the content type as text or plain, and then it will respond, uh, write out that, okay, it's a hello web app application. So you, this is a very simple application now. Um, there are a couple of things that and get involved in an application. Let's say you have to keep a counter of how many people visited your website. So what is the most uh, obvious thing that comes into your mind? The most obvious thing is that for every page load, you fetch an existing value of counter from the data store. 
or database, whatever it is, increment it by one, you store it back into the database. Now this approach goes fine as long as your application has a limited number of users visiting your website. Now let's say your application has about 10,000 people coming to your website per second as the case with Yahoo or let's say Google or any other website, YouTube or something. So in that case, if you proceed with this approach that you uh, take out a database value, you increase it, then you store it back. So this is definitely going to fail because there is a lot of number of requests. There is going to be data so contention for that. So there are a couple of techniques that uh, we use when we work on App Engine about how to get rid of those things, how to make your application really scalable, avoid data store uh, contentions and bottlenecks. And we'll be talking about those things in the coming slides. Okay, so um, App Engine Data Store. So App Engine Data Store is the scalable data storage for your applications. It provides uh, write once, read many. So the basic philosophy behind um, data store is that it's uh, it's scalable. As in scalable, it's it, it's a schema-less entities that are stored in the data store. So so when it's uh, and then there are like uh, all the things they are arranged by properties which are organized by application defined kinds. So for any app, uh, for any entity in the data store, there has to be a kind associated with it. And that is the only thing that is possibly required from our side. I mean, anything else that is just an uh, wrapper to make work for us easier. And then we can have queries on entities of the same kind. So this is very important that you cannot have queries on entities of different kinds. So if you have prepared a data store entity of kind, let's say user, then you will be able to query only on that, those particular entities which are of the kind user. You cannot take two entities of two different kinds and perform queries upon them. See, uh, so in, in talking to the relational database model, joins or something like that are completely non-supported in uh, App Engine. And then we can have a filter and sort properties on property values and keys. And then we have the pre-indexing. So what happens is that whenever you store any entity into the data store, Google App Engine first uh, um, checks that what kind of entity is it? Does it have a parent? Does it not have a parent? Is, is it a root entity or uh, what is, is it? And then it stores it into the data store along with, al along with indexing it. So there are certain properties or attributes of those entities which are indexed at the time of uh, storing the data. So the philosophy is that, you know, when uh, you store data, you think about all the possible uses that the data can have. You store it in a non-relational manner. It doesn't matter how much space it is taking because space is really very, very, very cheap. But the thing is that your application uh, shouldn't go slow when you are fetching the data because writing into the disk is, uh, it happens rarely as in comparatively very less as compared to reading from the disk. So this is what we need to take care of uh, while designing the database for any App Engine application. So an entity is uh, basically, it's, it contains of a key and it contains of a set of attributes. Now key is something that the data store manages. It is not something that you can um, edit or you can modify or you can do anything with it. So key is basically, it's uh, it's a uh, protocol buffer encoded value of uh, of the application ID and the parent, the kind, and other things. And then there are a set of attributes for any entity. So let's say we want to create a class person. So in this case, uh, what we'll do is from google.appengine.ext import db, we'll import date time as well so that we can know when this particular entity was created. And then we create class person and we inherit from class db.model. So we'll have the name as db.string property with required value to be true. Then we can have the birth date as db.date property. We can have a height as db.integer property. So there are a, uh, like in any SQL or in any relational databases, we have various type of properties, integer, long integer, big integer, float and uh, text and blob property. Similarly, we have all these properties in App Engine data store as well. So this is how uh, we make a particular property to be a string, to be a date, to be integer, to be boolean, whatever. 
Now then we have to like, uh, so this first part of it, this defining a class, this is basically, uh, basically a method how we can define an entity and when we have to, when we have to store it into the actual data store, we need to create an instance of it. We need to assign proper values to it. And after that, we can store it into the data store. So like here we have done uh, for person key underscore name equal to person underscore Ted. Now talking about keys, uh, there are a couple of things which are with any data store entity. The first one is, uh, yeah, key. So key, as I've told you, it's uh, something that App Engine manages. And then there are key name or ID. So if you, key name is basically, uh, yeah, any questions? Okay, so key name is basically a human readable value for uh, which is unique to an entity. And by uniqueness, it means that entities are path unique. It's not that, uh, you know, each entity has to be a unique key name. Each entity, any two entities can have same key name as long as their ancestors are different. So talking about ancestor, what it means is that uh, there can be parent-child relationship between entities. So let's say we have an entity X, which is let's say user entity, uh, or maybe a person entity, which is a parent entity. And then we can have a child entity of that entity, which could be, um, let's say, admin users or uh, students or some other kind of entities. So whenever we talk about a uh, child entity, the key of uh, that entity contains the whole path of that entity from the application. This um, data store, which is highly scalable. So uh, even, even this, the servers only know where one part of the data resides, where the other part of the data resides. So in order to make sure that, let's say, if you want to perform transactions or want to perform queries upon certain kind of entities, regular times, or maybe parent-child relationships, so you have to create a entity group for that. And this entity group basically tells that data so that, okay, these all things have to be stored in the same part of the distributed network. So that when we want to perform a transaction or when we want to perform a query on this, so it doesn't have to go and look through a lot of places uh, and hence it improves upon the latency. The thing about uh, app, app Engine data store is that everything has, you know, when, whenever you design the application, you have to think about the queries all the time that could be possible with your data. So the more deeper you dive into the queries, the more uh, more broad you can think about what all possible uh, outcomes could be of this data, what are the possible permutations and combinations in which I might be needing this data. So the more efficiently you store it into the data store and more efficiently you get it out and more fastly it goes. So this is all done for query performances, this is all done for application performances. And then there are uh, transactions. So transactions can be done only on uh, entities of the same entity group. So you cannot just uh, expect that two entities of different entity group or can be transacted upon. And then uh, as I tell, uh, told you about the parent-child relationship, so that is how it goes. Uh, there is an entity that is the child of other entity and then there are entities which are the parents of entities. And the concept of path and key uniqueness. So path uniqueness, path, uh, so uh, this path and key uh, uniqueness. So path, uh, so the path consists of all the ancestors that are al all along the entity. So that is what has to be unique. The key name uh, cannot be unique until and unless the whole path is unique. And then there are uh, fetching entities. Now, how do we fetch entities from the data store? So there are a couple of ways in which um, App Engine provides us APIs. The first one of them is like GQL, then we have the GQL query, then we have query and db.get. Now, as you can see, the GQL is um, looking very similar to SQL, like select star from person where name equal to, and then we have the first parameter as Ted. So, uh, or let's say the person object and uh, dot GQL where name equal to Ted, dot fetch 100. So this will uh, fetch 100 results from the data store and it will return me into the all underscore TEDs variable. Now, when we talk about uh, fetching data uh, from the data store, so the fastest way is when you do a get by key name or when you simply do a get. Basically, what happens is that whenever you do a get by key name, so the App Engine 
does uh, doesn't have to find out where it is stored as in it uh, when you you explicitly tell that okay uh, get by key name or get by key so it already has it in its index that where the entity is stored so it just goes over there and it directly fetches the data so this is the fastest way in which you can access the data so whenever you have to retrieve a data it is always recommended that you know you go with uh, db dot get key or model dot get by key name so this is how a data can be fetched in a very fast fashion now initially uh, when people jump on to um, google app engine they proceed with the gql which is relatively slow as compared to get by key name or db dot get so this is one point where um, enhancements can be made and then we have caching so for caching uh, app engine provides the memcache and app specific caching app instance caching so memcache is like uh, like the cache we have all in our motherboards so that is a small piece of memory wherein you can store temporary variables which are to be used very frequently so that is what memcache is and then there are app caching so every every application that you have it has certain number of instances and every instance has their own cache uh, the size of an instance cache is uh, i'm i'm not sure but it's about let's say 6 mb or something it might be a little more or a little less but it's uh, it has some um, instance caching i'll show you um, instance caching from one of our applications yeah this is uh, these are the details from uh, one of our applications um, one of our games basically mafia resurrections from oxy labs so as you can see there are as many as 60 instances of this application running at this moment and uh, these instances they have like and uh, you can see they have like 18000 seconds of lifetime they have 41000 seconds of lifetime so if an instance is in the memory for 18000 seconds and it has uh, some some uh, memory assigned to it so you can very well use those instance uh, caching application instance caching and you can even prevent the read calls or uh, from the data source so this is again uh, one performance um, thing that you can do it very fast okay so coming back to scalability we have a couple of things that you know uh, can help improve upon the applications so the first thing is like you can do read and write infrequently obviously this is uh, this is again an Uh, an oxymoron in itself as in any application it has to uh, read and write so you cannot just stop reading and writing but the key idea is that at the right time only you decide what are the possible read cases and you write the data accordingly so that you know if if write time takes a little longer time that is acceptable but if the reading of data takes a lot of time that is unacceptable then we have the keys key names and ids so you can uh, fetch the data using keys key names and ids so that it comes out to be a very fast manner then we have the batch reads and writes so instead of writing a data too often or writing a set of data too often into the data store what you can do is you can uh, batch get and batch read from the data store so batch reading and batch getting is very fast because what it happens is that you have your app engine um, app engine then it connects to the uh, data store apis and then it actually fetches the data so every time you do a read from the data store or write into the data store this whole connection has to be made so if you do a batch read or batch uh, batch write so all these connections um, they don't need to be made very frequently and hence it improves upon the performance and then other thing is uh, to keep the entity groups very small i mean as small as possible just not keep on expanding it because if the entity groups are very large it takes some time of to it introduces latency in reading the data and then we can have shading so as uh, you know i was talking about the counter model earlier so one possible way in which we can shard that particular uh, process is that we can have uh, n number of counters running at parallel so whenever your page is visited you just take a randomly a counter from the data so you increment it you store it into the data store so let's say if you have hundreds of counters and you want to find the what are the actual visits so you can just sum up all those things you can get the actual number of visits to your site so this is what sharding is and then you can always use uh, memcache to improve upon the performance for uh, those particular things that are very frequently needed uh all right i still i think i have some time left okay so we'll uh, proceed with a little bit of case study from uh, some social games and applications so uh, what basically oxy labs was into uh, developing social applications so at the time of developing applications we went along with php and mysql 
So I mean that is a very common um, set of application. So as our applications went into the flow, as our game started, you know, people like like uh, people started liking our games, and we have number of users coming. So our applications began to fail. There were a lot more server failures. Then we have to introduce more servers. We have to manage all the, and all those hassles was coming to our end. So what we did was we ported all our applications, all our games from MySQL, PHP to App Engine and Python. And since that day, you know, we have been living very comfortably. We don't need to worry about scalability. What we need to worry about is uh, how to make further enhancements. Let's say if a, if a particular instance or if a particular request takes, let's say, two seconds or one second, then how we can further reduce it to 0 0.5 seconds. And that is uh, possible that we have done in couple of months back, wherein a few of our calls were taking a lot of time, then we had improved a lot upon them, and now all those calls are taking very less time. So uh, this is how we we went from uh, a non-scaling architecture to a scalable architecture, and this has definitely helped us uh, gain a lot from the market and you know for uh, from all the other places as well. So uh, this is uh, this is all I have to uh, say about you know. Uh, scaling, scalable, uh, issue, uh, scalable issues with App Engine or how to scale using App Engine platform. So, you guys have any questions? Pardon? Yeah, I'll just show it. I think there's some problem with. Uh, uh, pardon? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the most important thing that that we uh, took care of while migrating from a PHP MySQL uh, infrastructure to Google App Engine is that uh, when we made an when we made those applications on PHP MySQL, we relied very heavily on stored procedures. We relied very heavily on joins and other things. So uh, these all things were just not present. So we we had to change a lot in our architecture. As in, uh, that was a big big you know uh, sh shift. But uh, we had to do this because that ultimately helped us to uh, grow. And uh, yeah, that is for the good only because when you rely so heavy on uh, joins and all these things, so they actually consume a lot of time and application goes slow. So we had a downtime of a certain period and after that we uh, shifted our, all our applications. Uh, um, as such, there is uh, no standard set of procedures that you must follow. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the biggest hassle is in converting the database from MySQL to App Engine. So that is the biggest thing, and that, uh, that ultimately, it depends on your application, how often you are going to use which data, how you are going to um, take all the data from this particular end to that particular end. But you know, if, if you want something in more in depth, then uh, Maybe you can contact me and I'll help you out more in how to uh, port all these applications, existing applications. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in 
in app engine app engine as of now it supports uh, 2.5 okay. uh, and 2.6 uh, only so the future versions of python like 2.7 or 3.x uh, yeah 2.6 it is supported No, I mean there are some issues in I think 32-bit version or 64-bit version of 2.5 or uh, 2.6 on on some of the Linux machines because of uh, some changes in their uh, way. I am not sure about what are the changes, but there are very small issues. But uh, you know those are easy to fix all those issues. But officially uh, Python 2.5 and 6 uh, like both are supported. Okay, so. Uh, I was really looking forward if I could show you uh, one of our games. Yeah. So you can see we have a couple of games on Facebook. We have a couple of games on High Five, Hives, MySpace, and Awkward. So. Uh, for Facebook, like we have, uh, we are coming uh, recently onto Facebook. So uh, our major games, like uh, the game Mafia Resurrection, which is based on the Mafia theme, it is not yet ported to Facebook. We are still on the process of uh, see because bas basically all the other platforms they work on open social, and Facebook is they have their differences. So so we are still working on uh, migrating open social to uh, Facebook. But other applications they are still there. So on. Uh, High five or hives. This. So if uh, if this working on app engine or working on scalable architecture or anything, it makes you excited. So obviously we have an open, we have couple of openings in Oxy Labs. So you can just come over here and drop your resumes on the email. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, of size XL and double XL are on sale at the reception. So if anybody wants some more T-shirts or wants them for, for the, want, want them for their friends, they can buy them at uh, 200 apiece. And uh, the other one was uh, the talk at the high tech hall. Uh, the last talk, uh, geospatial search frameworks, that's been cancelled. So uh, no talk, uh, no talk there. And uh, the third thing is. There's this uh, Indian Python Software Society annual general body meeting in this particular place, lecture hall one, uh, at the end. And that's at, I think, 5.15 to 5.45. So uh, whoever's here uh, at the end uh, is requested to attend uh, the annual general body meeting. Yeah, that's it. Django's approach is in order to deal with common web patterns we commonly encounter. So what is a paradigm? Paradigm is an abstract word. Basically, it refers to common concepts and abstract ones. You know, Wikipedia defines programming paradigm as concepts and abstractions used to represent elements of a program. So what then is a web development paradigm? I mean, if you take the same idea, it what how a particular web framework deals with models, the common, pa you know, the patterns that emerge, those can be termed as web application paradigms. Now, why do we have to deal with that? So as, as developers, our day-to-day -day job involves, in order to create, uh, involves creating solutions to problems. These solutions are obviously independent and unique. Whereas there, has, there is a very common theme between many of the solutions that we come across. So it is very important to understand what is the nature of abstraction that you need to do, how to provide enough hooks at various points of these abstraction so that you can override these in order to 
achieve various different ends all without overriding, you know, without having to re-implement most of the stuff all over again. So that is the philosophy behind why you need to understand about what web paradigm. And Django itself is a web application framework that considers itself to be, you know, uh, in, as, as the main web page says, it is a perfectionist with deadlines. So the way it implements its philosophy is to bundle everything so that the developer who uses it can be extremely productive and also meet the deadlines and not compromise anywhere in quality. In that philosophy, it comes with batteries included philosophy, which is uh, inherited from the general Python as the web frameworks, et cetera. If you see docs.djangoproject.com, you see various batteries included. This is what in the section itself, Django itself calls batteries included. Plenty of stuff here, right from admin types to signals to sitemaps to sites and you know the RSS feeds and serialization, pagination. Everything comes in built. So obviously, this as a developer, you need to take advantage of this in order to implement, you know, for your web application framework so that you don't go wrong anywhere. However, this is not necessarily scalable. I mean, it's not necessarily everybody wants a similar kind of RSS. It's not necessarily everybody wants same kind of signals to be dispatched. It's not necessarily everybody wants same kind of messages to be displayed. So there needs to be provided certain various uh, hooks needs to be provided particularly in Django uh, terminology, there are so many backends, as it calls, you know, that is what you override in order to achieve your intended behavior for uh, a given API. So we'll examine that going along. Uh, web application framework, as Pranav took earlier session, it is a simple web application framework that uses custom APIs on the Google infrastructure. So, I mean, uh, basically, because it is a simple framework, you do not get any of these batteries. However, they bundle certain services which are very common, like uploading files, storing images, etc., in as uh, various services and provide APIs for that, which can be used within web app or various other frameworks. So that that is what uh, Google Web uh, App Engine Web App Framework is. However, which we are not going to really deal with unless any specific question arises or in, anywhere it makes sense to examine it in further detail. So yeah, as I said, that's what you're going to do today. We'll examine what are the various uh, abstractions that Django uses and how you can take make use of these batteries in order to make your application a lot more, uh, you know, extremely, uh, with a very less effort, how you can achieve more. And that's, that's the point of this, uh, making a web framework batteries included and then realizing complex abstractions within the framework. How do I, how why should you assume I know anything about what I'm going to talk about? That is because I've been a author of some popular uh, web applications, uh, Django applications, which are open source as well as proprietary. I work at a consulting company called as Agilic Solutions, where we offer development and consulting exclusively in Django and related Python technology stack. So finished with the introduction, we're going to go through various uh, ways where Django releases these abstractions, one of those in the following order. We're going to see what abstractions are realized in forms and how authentication can use various alternative approaches. And then what are the common views with Django bundles within itself so that you don't even have to write views. Then there are other stuff, caching, serialization, pagination. We're going to examine that. So coming to forms. What is the most important thing that you do in a form, in a web application, in a, in a web? One of the most important thing that you have to do is to fill up a form. So obviously, when you enter a lot of data, it has to be stored into a table. And more likely than not, your data has to be stored into a table. I mean, that's why you're taking it. So one of the most common things that you encounter is you give a display a list of fields that you have to store in a database. So a database table, how do you do that? Using Django, what you can do is, um, use an abstraction called as model form. So models you would have already defined. When you say model form and you say, uh, you, s you only have to point out to Django what model you want to form displayed. Say for example, here I'm saying article form. All I need to say is within a class meta, class meta is a differentiator in order to pass various parameters within Django. So uh, that is a met within that all you need to say is what, art what model to which is, is to which you need a form. You just provide this detail, Django automatically spits out the, all the necessary HTML 
also does the validation and uh, provides you a uh, you know very good uh, extreme it provides you a lot of convenience in order to deal with user input as well as saving it so if you save it all you have to do is if it is a particular model and you have to display all fields and save it all you need to do is save so models as you know are uh, physical represent uh, are um, programmatic representation of physical entities in case of a, a post if you speak about blog this is a this would how a model be so basically it has various fields so this is a post where um, if you want a model form of this then you would say you would extend a model for you extend django dot forms and model form and then you would say the model that you for which you want a model form is post so that's all you want to do so the form is there it renders html it also does validation so model api i mean i assume most of them most of you will already be familiar with this this is how a django model api look basically you query you use the model object you use the model class and you have there is a objects method on it sorry objects on it which is a model manager on which you can access various queries in order to perform the database transaction what what if you want to save foreign keys so for example first thing we encounter first thing we have to have a list of fields that you want to be saved into the same table what you do is have a model form what if the most common cases that we need is most common case that we encounter in forms is you display a poll and poll has a list of choices so poll has to be a entity as well as a list of foreign keys have, have to be another entity which have foreign key to polls so this is another common occurrence how would you deal with it django deals with it by using our something called as model form set not necessarily model form set as such because not all form sets and forms have to be model forms we'll get to that so model so in in that case where you want to display a list of model form list of options for a particular model that have associated entity of as a same object then you use a model form set model form set very similar to model form in, instead of you will have to do it in a view take it you take you import the model form set fact is a method and you pass to it the argument what is the model that you want for which model form set so say and then you instantiate that class and so that statement model form set has many options just like model form and forms so basically you can call is valid on a model form set what would it do i mean on a on a form or a model form it validates whether the form is valid what does is is valid on a model form set or a form set in general does so is valid verifies each and every form whether it is valid and if it is not valid it displays accordingly the error messages where they are not model form set also has errors associated in the form of a dictionary and uh, most important thing uh, you can display the same form set um, forms you can give you can give pass the model form set an entity to which it also populates all the existing entities and when the modification takes place the modification is displayed only modified entities are saved back to the database and those modified forms are displayed in modified form sets rather are present in forms or mod change of forms similar is so similar to form model form save you also have form set to save so similarly if if you already had data populated form set uh, also populates the data as it is so uh, you don't necessarily so you can to a form set you can also pass a existing entity so existing values get populated or you don't have to pass an existing entity so the fields get displayed empty so when you modify only those entities that are changed also get saved back to the database i mean all through we have been talking about only model form set and model form because we assumed we will have to be saving to the same data same table but not necessarily the case most of more of most often than not we will have to save the data that you obtain from a particular web form into several tables or you need to do something else with it or even to save to a particular database you need to associate more number of fields than that you obtain from the user yourself because obviously things like user name also might be present on several of these models which you do not prompt to the user that needs to be explicitly set so you don't necessarily have to use a model form or a model form set these those can also be form or a form set and in the form and what's the difference between them these do not map directly themselves to any particular model you write a same method where you can do whatever you want and so that is where you well design pattern that is where you associate 
the other entities that are present within the model, uh, the appropriate values, uh, or you split the val values that you obtained from the form into various tables, and then you can save. The form.save, form set.save would again typically do the same thing, except in this case, you would have customized it in order to save to various tables or to add more entities into the values within a given table. Form preview, one of the other things that you want to do is you ta you've taken a value uh, in within the form before saving, you have to show to the user, uh, hey, look, these are the values that we populated. Uh, can you confirm to us whether it is right or wrong? This is one of the standard pattern. How would you do it? Django provides a, a built-in mechanism even for that. It's called as form preview itself. You import this particular class from Django contrib form tools preview. So you extend the particular class and then uh, to this particular class within the URL, uh, within the URL you need to pass a set of forms that you, uh, sorry, within the URL you pass the form of which preview you want to be displayed at this particular URL and that is all. So basically as the URL you are, pa you are passing some model form because this is some model form preview is what I've extended model preview and because this is a model form you don't need to define any fields and because, and then after saving, so there, this same form preview, uh, you have to define the interface, the done method where, wherein you define after preview what to do. Basically after the, when the view confirmation comes, that is where the request gets passed. So here you're supposed to do what you want to do with the data. So basically another common occurrence, the point of this is another common occurrence is to display a particular value. How would you do that in Django? Is by just importing a form preview and telling it what form you want displayed in what URL. Another form paradigm is form wizard. You go through, you don't necessarily want to bombard a user with so many different values, so many various input options within the same page and then save the data. Rather, you would want to uh, split the values into various, over various uh, pages. So one of the ways of doing that would be by using a form wizard. You define various forms independent of each other and then say, in, then import a form wizard from Django to contrib dot forms. So is that a step? Yeah, fine. I mean, I haven't mentioned the import location, but that should be it. So where you take the form wizard and you extend that, again, even after, even in this case, you have various interfaces defined. Basically, you can, uh, when the form wizard completes, what do you want to do? Or uh, when a step is completed, what do you want to do? So define each step, what do you want to do before each step, after each step? or you know you can do a lot of stuff within that so basically there are a lot of methods within this one also so form wizard takes care of that okay that about the forms now let's get into how django does authentication and how various things can be overridden in order to do the your nature of authentication standard way of authentication everybody needs login everybody needs logout register password reset for some then when some, somebody asks for a password reset you obtain his email or his username send him a password reset and then he clicks the button and then he comes back to your page and him what is his new password and save it. All this has to be done, all this has to be done repeatedly again and again and again in each and every application you build you don't have to. In Django you just have to define the patterns because all these are defined standard views, those are defined within the framework so you just have to point to at what URLs you want these views to present at. So basically this is a standard URL pattern for authentication, you just point to all these things and these will be done for you but does not necessarily mean all login is similar to what Django thinks is login. All login means all re uh, password reset is similar to what Django thinks it is password reset. So it needs to provide various hooks in order for you to customize how to change these, you know, uh, how to change the default behavior of these particular paradigms. So uh, with authentication, there are so many pages, for example, without getting authenticated, you go to your mailbox. What does it do? It doesn't give you, you're not authenticated. It should say, hey, first log in and then I'll take you to the page. That is one of the common patterns. So what you do for that is to uh, just uh, import a decorator called as login required, which is also bundled within the authentication framework. And on every view that you want, user logged in or a user, every view that expects a user object, you just slap a decorator saying, in this way, login required is required. So, and then what is a redirect field name? So that provides it a login page where the login, uh, which will have a post parameter redirect to. So that is how you do when the user goes into any particular page that requires and he is not authenticated, 
this pattern enables him to get authenticated and go to the go back to the same page that he was earlier intending to go without causing any interruption so, so as i said how do you customize the various aspects of authentication so let's see what authentication is authentication by itself involves setting a cookie at your system uh, in order to identify you to a tie you to a particular session object with a session key that i have stored in a database the the session does need not necessarily be database let's assume that for simplicity so given this session you have various uh, fields as, uh, associated with it the username the file that you uploaded the when did you come last time i mean there could be so many or you could set any of your application level uh, session variables so well, what exactly does it mean authentication involved authentication involves setting a cookie verifying whether the yes, browser supports cookie because who knows you could be using something else um, not a browser you could be using a console browser doesn't support cookies or something so it involves verifying whether the cookies the cookies your browser supports cookies setting a cookie associating yourself with a particular session key in a table and inputting all your user specific values into the se session table at your session key so how would you how would you override it what are the things an authentication would require so wait authentication doesn't only require that authentication also need to tell you whether a particular user has passed an authentication or has failed an authentication so it requires obviously that is a boolean uh, method so django implements this authentication in the form you can override the django's default behavior of authentication backends by using overriding the backend basically you provide a very different backend which needs to support very only two different methods which is get user and authenticate that is all because the rest of it is redundant you need to always do the associating cookie in the session etc so if you want to tomorrow do a, a authenticate a user based upon his uh, based upon a username and password that you set in a text file rather than looking up the database you can easily do that is exactly all you need to do for that basically you say authenticate okay it's not exactly all you need because the authenticate part is not complete so basically you need to look from the text file in order to read whether the user is existing that is adds more security and then get user these are the two methods that uh, set, uh, authentication backend will always authentic django authentication will call so you can customize these in order to do that how much can this be customized as much as you want in fact one of the applications that i have been a part of called django social authentication it unlike a typical django authentication which requires the user to register and save the username in the database and password it's not necessary um, one of the most common requirements today is to not ask a user to get get his authentication from various third party credentials which could be open id yahoo google yeah 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 it uses oauth yeah so basically it involves some of these uh, involve basically already support open id so some of these authentication involves uh, just mentioning the endpoints and some others like google implements its own federated login api which also provides details so those have been taken care and then facebook is even more complicated so basically if we create extra tables this application creates extra tables and associates uh, that has a foreign key with a unique uh, or user table so each and, and correspondingly the authenticate as well as the get user method is overridden so we provide obviously because django if anybody has used know that it is not possible to use with a user because user because i am assuming you going to use many other third party applications so create a user instance and give appropriate name based upon his username you obtain by google or facebook otherwise prompt him for user so there are plenty of options plenty more can be done so basically this is a point of illustrating how a good abstraction can be achieved basically everything can be done by just by mentioning a few uh, url patterns but does, that does not limit you you can go on and customize by overriding certain methods whatever you want to do and then let's get into views that's about authentication and one of the simple things you need is to display a template the list of values is the most common one of the common web things so well, how would you do that you don't even have to write a view so you just write a template this is the place you want different things so django has a concept called as generic views url patterns assume you're all aware of i mean we already gone through about it once so basically url specify is where you specify at what urls you want what so in this case i import direct to template a uh, view the generic view that is defined within django or generic views views to generic rather so this particular view you, all you want to do is the direct to template you don't even have to write a view 
you just say this URL, this is the template, and these parameters. Those parameters can, could even we get populated. We don't even need a view. Oh, another disclaimer, I'm saying this, I'm not necessarily saying this is the best way to do it. Some of these implementations, particularly generic views and form wizard, etc., are not to be the best implementations currently existing in Django, but I think they represent a very good abstraction. You know, the highest level abstraction, which lets you do a lot by using less. And they can be better, and over the course of time, they're also getting better. The generic views are now being made as classes instead of views. I mean, that is a proposal that is existing, so that enables a lot more customization. So direct to template takes uh, um, the particular URL and takes what are the parameters that needs to be populated to which template. You don't even have to write a view, so it goes directly there. Object-based generic view, you're watching a mail or you're seeing a, a site that gives a particular blog or something, a particular, so what are the things that you need? You need a list of mails, is one page, you need one particular mail that is one page. You need a page to create a your page that is one view. So these are all standard object-based views that any application would require. Okay. So one of the so Django also provides uh, object-based generic views. Uh, the two common object-based generic views are object list and object detail. These object list and object detail, as you can already guess, without you having to write any of the views pass a particular object, given the particular primary key or the slug, as you call in the parameters, and pass it to a particular template. So most, many of the cases, I mean, you would, this would be more than sufficient in order to build a fairly decent application without even having to write a view. Yeah, generic, basically you don't have to write views, generic views, but <laughs> to be fair at this point, I also have to tell you that uh, generic views are notorious today as of today's implementation for being not customizable, so most people end up using uh, standard views by not using generic views. But then the point, the concept definitely remains. It, they can provide a better implementation that is being looked into. The list of generic views, there is direct to template. You can pass any uh, list of values that you obtain from anywhere and with the users provided uh, values of whatever into directly into template. You can use a redirect to object list and object detail we saw. Similarly, there is create object, update ob object, and delete object. You want to create a new object, you just have to pass the parameters of the new object and uh, provide what is the object. That is a create object. Delete, you just pass the primary key of the slug based upon the configuration. You just pass it as another parameter within the URLs required. Not just this, generic views also provide the other forms of generic views, which is a uh, common WordPress template system, which is slash 2009, slash 10, slash 05, slash, so basically those are other generic view patterns. So basically you, and then you show a list of posts pop, you know, populated in 2010, slash 2010, slash 05 will show you all 2010 May posts, 2010, slash 05, slash 01 shows all these things. So those are also provi provided automatically. So if you're going to build a blog application that has to be cross compatible with your WordPress system or you're going to import a WordPress system, you don't have to write any views because those views are already existing. You just have to map the URLs and say, okay, these URLs, these are the views that I want. So your WordPress remains intact. And not necessarily, I don't think that, I personally don't think that's the best URL system. I would rather prefer, I mean, unless you are a heavy blogger that keeps blogging every day, that's not a URL. So I would not keep that as a standard, but you can always have that as a fallback. Those URLs exist. You can also have other URL patterns where the stack overflow kind, which slug is dynamically produced and then has URL has a PK or whatever you want. Those about the generic views, there can be more kind of generic views. Maybe you can take up take it up later. But and now let's get into caching system. Carl Henderson, the creator of Flickr, is famous known famous for saying this code, saying normalized data is for sissies. So basically, if you are running any production application, you can't have a normalized data because uh, you have to display it to the user by querying the database all too often. How would you counter this? I mean, obviously, Pranav took a session before. He said, you write many times. I'm not a fan of that at all, at least personally. Write, writing many times to maintaining many duplicate copies of the same data can lead to nasty bugs that you will end up fighting very dearly with. Instead, my preferred way of, that is a runtime problem. It needs to be solved in the runtime. 
one of the ways of doing it is to implement proper caching systems over the database which is totally normalized and these caching systems take care uh, you know that is uh, these caching system take care of the runtime necessities into map uh, rather than querying the database again and again repeatedly django properly fortunately provides a very strong caching system which will go if say you have a page that displays both flickr and twitter how would you do caching for this one of the common system one of the common methods of caching of any web application is to cache the entire page it doesn't make sense because anything that is more than a minute old for in twitter is very old for me but it doesn't make sense to query flickr every minute how would you implement caching system you don't have to do the page based caching django provides a sufficient hook in order to def define a, in order to do caching per block basis and then render the html based on the block basically caching system is also very uh, very simple in order to customize you just have to provide the get key you know the key the value as well as the time at which it expires the rest of it is taken care and caching again very similar to authentication is also can be customizable by using backends the caching backends in include memcache database etc which we'll go through so one of the ways of achieving performance improvement for any application is to generally memcache every page memcache is a very nice software developed by live journal people fortunately even today any web application that you put uh, can be cached at least for a certain amount of time and just generally memcaching the entire system every page uh, can improve, improve the performance by several fold you know this is one of the, you don't have to bother about it this is the, another way how an abstraction has to be achieved so you don't have to configure anything you just have to say hey i want everything memcached so great so it automatically generates keys and automatically provides values and uh, html pages appropriately as relevant so but that doesn't always work as we saw we have a case where you need both flickr uh, data and twitter data in the same page it doesn't make sense for us to display the old twitter data or query flickr again and again so what do you need to do for that is in this this part this is actually a quoting from production application so it doesn't make sense don't worry so basically it, it provides a caching decorator which i apply on top of each view or a which is implemented in this case as a class so it obtains a particular key as well as value and then to the cache for i pass a particular value so i could cache at way so many different blocks by just passing the val uh, duration that i want to so in case you want so basically uh, it, it's, it's a very simple function basically at the end of it basically it has two levels of uh, decorating system because you need to have a decorator with a parameter that's how to achieve okay thanks so that's how we, if you take the cache like that we can apply it on the block uh, various block we're passing a parameter to each block what is the duration you want it cached for caching can be on various uh, uh, backends as i earlier said it could be on database i don't know why you would do it as apparently the database caching unless you have badly implemented uh, joins all across your system doesn't actually contribute anything in fact it shouldn't contrib contribute anything because your system should be good enough in calling appropriate joins etc it could also be file system caching it could be local memory caching it could be dummy caching wherein in local development you don't want any caching to be done but caching you don't want to remove the decorator just for development so you just say local backend then nothing happened then caching will not be enforced but uh, the, you don't have to remove any of the apis so there we discussed about caching and uh, authentication and generic views and forms there are so many other paradigms that we commonly encounter one of them is internationalization localization uh, the orker was a us nobody predicted that to become famous in india and brazil it did so it is very important that you internationalize any of web application that you provide because you don't know who where would be using it django provides a very good system for internationalization you just have to specify uh, it's, i think it's based on a standard uh, internationalization system that is existing across web applications where, wherein you have po and mo files so you have a list of things that are in the mo po files with corresponding languages uh, file names as languages so during the runtime request uh, based upon the browser the browser header language setting it passes the appropriate strings rather than passing the english string all the time humanization it is very important just like you don't see at 14 23 minutes etc you see in twitter a few minutes ago so that's also built into the django uh, templating system all you need to do is import a particular filter and say 
this is minute uh, human eyes so it says few minutes ago one day ago 15 days ago etc we i don't want to get into cs csr production because it's a lack of time so similarly there is pagination sorting data grid thumbnail pagination every as we said we pass list of objects we pass we saw a particular object uh, when we pass a list of objects we are necessitated in order to uh, paginate you can't obviously pass tens of thousands of emails into the same page so pagination is also inbuilt but more importantly than how how well django does it there are external applications i haven't actually gone through this because it's not achieved by using an other than the csr protection within the django at itself but come as other other external applications you can google for django pagination django sorting django data grid so basically the, all the applications that provide you without any configuration e pagination django pagination calls itself dig style pagination so you call a template tag and you say this is a model that you need to be paginated within the template and you say here i want the page numbers done basically it adds a middleware and then uh, queries a particular uh, it configures the parameters of the uh, of the database query based upon you get parameters which it reads within the middleware so your view does not actually get it similarly sorting uh, data grid so data grid rather you want pagination you want sorting so you want a huge set of list, list, listing to be displayed something like excel so that is exactly what a data grid does except in in which you, in data data grid is another application that i have been part developing so basically you specify a data grid and you say what are the various fields and what all different fields that you want pagination on and where all you want sorting so that that's how it definitely pro 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 provides you an object as well as a data grid so within the template all you have to do is say data grid and it also comes with templates and template tags so you know where to you know it knows how it to render itself except for classes which may be unique to customers oh so one more thing other than all this we saw pagination we saw object list we saw create object we saw delete object we saw uh, etc how about adding all these things into a same application given a model you need to add you need to delete it you know play various point case you know you need to display a paginated etc so how about realizing bundling everything in a same package i mean that's exactly what django admin is so you just write a model and this is not today's application this is django came bundled with django admin about when in, in its initial release of 0.9 so it is about 5 years ago so you just write a model and you say i want an admin for this model that is all so it provides you entire web app crude the crude dear model which is create a delete and it also displays based upon your configuration the foreign keys of this associated with this particular model and it also tracks what all you know what all the actions that you have taken within this application using another model where it uh, tracks the history of the admin and not just uh, not just that uh, uh, listing of the admin and crud it also okay uh, this is how you create an admin you a uh, post and a comment register those particular uh, models for admin and then you want to say uh, you, you you really have to appreciate how simple it is you just say list display title date time and then list display text so that it knows what it needs to do similar to list display and list uh, list display there are also other fields called a search and list filter etc which provide you free searching filtering and sorting so this is a standard list page it shows basically which which is achieved without writing any serious amount of code basically it has django uh, admin it extends and it says list display photo caption creation date and list filter has an options by site and by creation date that's all so and then i think it also has list filter with a particular parameter saying year so that year comes there not just that when you want to it also provides there is an add add photo or add add, add, a, add a particular entity in the right top so you go to add an entry it a uh, entirely composed web application with at least with not bad ui ui then the taste of web ui keep changing but this has been a pretty decent ui 5 years ago and still not bad so it, that, that is how you can also add an entry it is not enough to add an entry even you just submit it without any values it validates to say that this field is required you need to configure that within admin if you don't want to or pass a particular appropriate form so that's about the admin so these are the various paradigms now if you have some questions please ask
or if you don't have questions, you saw various paradigms that are realized how in the in the Django way, you how how are they realized in the framework of your choice? Would you want to share or any other paradigm common occurrence that you see realized very well in your framework? Etc. Anybody wants to share or ask any questions? All right. So unless you have any questions, that is it. Thanks. And that'll give us more time for questions. Is that okay? Yes? All right. So we'll start in about five minutes. Director of Social Impact at ThoughtWorks, which means I oversee our efforts in um, uh, areas where technology can be used for social good. That means things like poverty reduction, healthcare, relief, that sort of effort. And uh, today, me and my colleague Diptanu are going to talk about a project that we did for UNICEF in Iraq. Uh, we completed about two, three months ago. Yeah. And so I'm going to give a little background on the project uh, itself and what its goals were. And Dutano is going to walk through some of the technology we used. And it was a, a pretty much an all Python project. So the project was using SMS uh, in the Iraqi context to reach out to children and understand the condition of the lives of children within Iraq. And um, one of the questions is, why use SMS in the field of international development? Uh, the first answer is mobile networks are pretty much ubiquitous at this time. Anyone here know how to turn up the volume? Is that better? All right, I'll just talk louder. So. I have here a map that was put together by some colleagues at UNICEF a couple years ago, so it's a bit out of date. Uh, that shows the population density of Africa. So all the orange and, and areas are areas of high population. Uh, the black areas are lakes or water. This overlay, the purple, shows where there is electricity available. So as you can see, much of the population in Africa is covered by electricity. These are the GSM networks. Almost the entire population of Africa was covered by GSM two to three years ago. Today, it's almost completely covered. According to the GSM Association, 97% of all humans on the planet live within range of a GSM signal. So that will soon be 100%. So this is an interesting, this is a screen from a website called, excuse me, called Phone Count which counts the population of the planet and how many of them are connected to cell phone networks. And they predict that um, we are about half a year away from everybody on the planet having access to cell phones, at least by network. So of course, mobile phones themselves are very common. Uh, most people you meet will know how to use them. Uh, but they're what the industry calls feature phones. So I'm using a fancy iPhone here. 99% of the world uses a phone that only does voice and SMS. That's what they call feature phones. So SMS really is the base platform. If you want to reach people using mobile networks, you can reach them on SMS. And even though SMS itself is very limited, restricted to 160 characters uh, per message in English, 70 characters per message if you're using a, a non-Latin script like Chinese or Arabic, the fact that they're ubiquitous means that you have ubiquitous data collection. So you can, if you're working on projects, and we've done projects with, uh, I'll go over some later, but we've done projects with uh, national health services, you can communicate with all the health workers in the country. You can get real-time analysis. So uh, as an example, uh, when health workers go out into the field, they tend to record information about the populations who's sick, uh, who has malaria, for example, on pieces of paper that then get shuffled into boxes and sent back to clinics and then sent up to hospitals and then sent to the Ministry of Health. And a year or two later, it gets entered into a computer. But if you can text that information in, 
it goes immediately into the systems and you can do real-time real -time analysis, which also means that you can do real-time feedback. So there are interesting projects using village health workers in remote villages through Africa and India where these health workers text in information like the size of the arm of a child that they're seeing and the system texts back whether that child is malnourished or not and what kind of treatment they need. Uh, I believe that refers to the number of phones that actually have a data connection. So for this project, we used two Python-based open source projects, uh, Rapid SMS and PyGSM. Uh, PyGSM is a library for interfacing with GSM modems for sending and receiving text messages. And Rapid SMS is a Django-based framework for doing two things primarily, building web UIs to these applications, that's the Django part, and uh, processing the text messages to do the logic that's specific to your project. So these are just a of projects, a short list of projects, some examples that are out there today that are using Rapid SMS and PyGSM. Uh, UNICEF Malawi has a malnutrition management program where, as I mentioned earlier, they send health workers out to the field who measure the arms of children and report back uh, cases of malnutrition using SMS. Uh, Millennium Villages Project and Columbia University have a project called Child Count, which was based on the Malawi work, but extends it. So it registers children in rural areas, uh, primarily in Africa, uh, births and deaths and people moving out of areas, and uses this information to guide village health workers to deliver health care. UNICEF Nigeria did a project unrelated to health. Well, it is health and welfare, but unlike the other two, uh, it was really supply chain management where they distributed several hundred thousand anti-malarial bed nets. And if, as you can imagine, uh, Nigeria is a lot smaller than India, but it's still pretty big, about 150 million people. And they, did, they distributed hundreds of thousands, I think it may actually have been more than a million bed nets. And they needed to track them from central distribution centers to regional, to individual clinics, to individual health workers and then individual families who received them. And they did this by having people report the whole chain along the way, what they had received and what they had distributed.